not going to talk about classical cryptography, but about actual quantum protocols where we send around quantum states. Um, and the topic is quantum posi position verification in the random oracle model. So let me first tell you what position verification is. So what is the thing we want to achieve here? Um, so imagine you have some um, mobile device um, that is in some position in space, say in some place in a shopping mart or something, uh, a shopping mall, and it wants to prove to some service provider that it is in a particular place. So just think of a mobile phone that wants to access some services that are only in this shopping mall. Uh, it's a pretty futuristic um, mobile phone because it manages to send quantum states or, uh, wirelessly, but um, besides that, it's just a normal mobile phone. Oh. But that's the basic idea what we want. So how can this device prove that it is in a particular location in space? You know, it can't just claim I'm in, I'm in this mall because it could be outside the mall. So the basic idea is that we want to set up a number of verifiers at the, say, at the corners of the mall. So, and then this device uh, answers certain questions from these verifiers in such a way that only a device that is in this position in space can answer all these questions in time. So we use that the speed of light is bounded, so we want to make a protocol where someone who is, for example, here will be too late in answering the questions for this device. Um, if someone of you knows the problem of distance bounding, you may wonder what's the difference, because distance bounding is a very well-studied problem. Well, distance bounding if, is if this device wants to prove he's very close to this antenna. So that's a distance thing. But this one is not close to anyone. Yeah, there are positions that are closer to this one, for example. So in position verification, we want to put the mobile phone in an arbitrary position in the convex hull of all the verifiers, and it wants to prove that it is there. So let's first look at uh, the question whether we can achieve this classically. So for this, let's first go down to the one-dimensional case. So we have a one-dimensional shopping mall, and uh, the prover is somewhere in the middle, and here are the two verifiers. This is space, and this is the time axis, so I will make some space-time diagrams because that's a cool-sounding word. And the prover wants to prove that he's here. So a generic protocol would be one where the two verifiers send some values x and y to the prover, and he receives it in, well, after a certain time, so in this space-time location. And now the prover needs to compute some answers, so he computes some function fxy and gxy and sends them back to the verifiers, and the verifiers check. This is the generic framework. I mean, we could have more messages and so on, but if we have just one round, this is the generic framework. So, can this be secure? Well, let's look at the following attack. So assume the adversary is not in this place where he claimed to be, but he has one device here and another device here. So this is crucial. The adversary uses two different devices, so he, so he uses several devices, but he has no device in the location where he claims to be, so this adversary should fail to prove that he's here. So the signals X and Y go on their way, but they're intercepted at this point in space and at this point in space. So in space-time here, the adversary learns X and here he learns Y. And what the adversary does is he just forwards it to his second device, or the second device to the first device, and he also keeps the value. So at this point in space-time, the, uh, the adversary 1 will know x and y. He can send f of x, y, compute it and send it. And here, this one will know x and y and send g of x, y. And as you see from this picture, all the answers will be just in time. Now, this was just the 1D case. Ah, yeah, so it's broken. And this was rather generic protocol. And while well, the same reasoning applies to 3D protocols as well, can be generalized to a number of verifiers, and it even works when you make some strong computational assumptions. So, because we didn't use anything that the adversary is uh, unlimited here. Only when you make some physical assumptions like the limit on the transfer capability of devices, then you can get around it, but even mirrors break that assumption, so it's uh, technically a bit doubtful. So this was all proven uh, not by me, but already in 2009. 
So classically, we won't, will not manage to get position verification. But what happens if we are in the quantum case? So in the quantum case, this attack does not work because here's the little picture of the middle of this of the picture right before. The two adversary devices forward x and y, but they also keep x and y because they need both values at these points. So the adversary copies the values x and y at some point in the protocol. And in the class, uh, if x or y is a quantum state, this will not in general be possible. Therefore, the attack I have described does not work in the quantum setting. But that doesn't mean that there are not, no other attacks. And in fact, um, in this paper, it was shown that if the adversary is computationally unlimited, he can also break the generic protocol. So if x and y are quantum states, he does some rather surprising th things that were called uh, instantaneous non-local computation. Was it that word? Well, he does something very fancy and uh, manages to, to get effectively the same thing as he would do by copying the state. So he gets the right information in the right moment. Uh, the problem is this attack in general uses exponential entanglement. So it does not mean that an efficient adversary can break the protocol, but it excludes information theoretically secure protocols. Unless um, you make some additional restriction, namely, if you are willing to assume that no photons or whatever you use for these quantum states, if you assume that you make no entanglement in the protocol, then the following protocol actually works. So, um, the verifier creates a random BB84 state psi. Doesn't have to be BB84, but let's think of BB84. And the second verifier picks a random basis. Then the first verifier sends the state, the second verifier sends the basis, and once the prover gets the state and the basis, he will, able, uh, he will measure the state in the basis and send on the measurement outcomes. So um, this protocol was shown to be secure if there is no entanglement between different adversary devices. Um, the proof was extended to the in, in this work to the case that uh, where the adversary has only a limited amount of entanglement, so less than the state is big. Um, so at the first glance, this may at least today sound like a very realistic assumption that the adversary cannot have large amounts of entanglement because we even have trouble storing single qubits. But uh, do I have a picture for that? No. Where's the picture gone? Uh, let's, let's see whether I have it somewhere in the end. <coughs> ah, that was too hard. That was bad. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, but I want to go to the slide first. How do I scroll? Yeah, okay, that was the slide. Damn it. <laughs> okay, sorry for the interruption. Okay, yeah, uh, you can actually circumvent uh, this result without storing any quantum money by having a prover in the right place, and he just sends entangled photons, and they're used just at the moment when they reach the other devices. So it is an assumption about the limitation of entanglement, but it's not about stored entanglement because the time you need to store the, effectively store the entanglement is just the time it needs to transfer the normal messages. So it's not really about quantum memory. So at least for my feeling, I'm not an experimentalist, I don't know for sure, the assumption is also something which is hard to argue already in the near future. Okay, now I can go back. So, uh, yeah, and there's another problem. Um, this protocol is proven in the 1D case, but there is no, it's probably secure in the 3D case, but we don't have a security proof for that. Okay, so that was the um, state of the art, essentially, on quantum position verification. So let me explain to you now my protocol. So we start with the same protocol we had before, so 
a state is sent here and the base is sent here, but we change it a bit. Instead of sending the basis over here right away, we, uh, the two verifiers send random, random, random values, x1 and x2, and as soon as they reach the prover, the prover takes x1 and x2, hashes them, uh, exhausts them, hashes them, and this is the basis in which you will measure psi. Now, this does not circumvent the gener generic uh, exponential amount of entanglement attack. Um, but as I will show you, if the prover is computationally limited, then in the so-called random oracle model, uh, yeah, first it avoids the attack that is known on the other protocol, but you can do efficiently if you have uh, a bit more entanglement, but not too much. Um, and it is provably secure in the random oracle model. What is the random oracle model? In the random oracle model, we model the hash function as a fully random function. So it's not a very complicated function, but it's just a really random function. Each output of the function is independently chosen. Uh, these functions do not actually exist in the real world, but <coughs> it's a very common uh, idealization in cryptography. And if we model H in this way, then I can prove security of this protocol. So let me show you the security proof. Um, so we want to show that in this setting, yeah, so the verifier sends psi and x1, this verifier sends x2, there is no adversary in this space region, so he cannot do any operations here, he can do a lot of operations here, a lot of operations here. We want to show that he will not be able to send the correct measurement results here and here in time. So, uh, yeah, perhaps I should also say, we for the analysis, we changed the protocol a bit that Psi is actually uh, entangled with some state that the verifier keeps because otherwise he cannot find out what the, measurement, the correct results would be. But um, that's just for the analysis. So, um, how do we do that? Well, the first thing we observe is that until this time t here, there's no location in space-time where x1 and x2 are simultaneously known. <coughs> this means there's no location in space-time where the adversary can guess x1 or x2. I mean, there are some uh, locations where you can guess x1, there are some locations where you can guess x2, but never in the same space. Yeah? Because the light cone, how x1 travels, is this area, the light cone of x2 is this area, and they intersect for the first time here. Strings. Uh, yeah, otherwise you could guess it. Yeah. Um, so until here, it's not known. And now we use a trick that is very common in um, classical cryptography, but it's um, not so easy in quantum cryptography. We program the random oracle. What does that mean? Well, since the random oracle is just a random function, uh, and since this random function, at least intuitively, will not have been queried by the adversary at this position yet, querying it at x1, xor, x2 will just produce a random value. So if we just say, from this point on, we switch the output of h to be a different value, the adversary will never notice that. <coughs> because, well, he hasn't queried it before, so he will not notice that we change it. This intuition can be made formal in the um, classical setting. In the quantum setting, it's not completely correct. Be exactly. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, the adversary could, for example, query the superposition of all inputs of H and would get the superposition of all outputs. So what I have argued now only is a, leads to proof in the classical setting. In the quantum setting, you need to work harder, but you can still show that this replacement is bounded in terms of the probability that the adversary here could guess x. Um, yeah, it's not trivial, so I, I can't show you how, but it can be done. So that's one of the technical, technically important um, sub-results here. Uh, Charlie? Does the output of the pair of the oracle have to be a, a many-bit one, or is it just a single bit? 
Uh, I've analyzed it for the many bit case. Uh, I guess if it's a single bit, you would get a protocol that you need to repeat sequentially. I'm not sure, I, uh, but I guess it would work out that way then. Um, okay, so we program H um, at this point in space time to be the value B. Well, now we have already achieved something. Namely, what we have achieved is that B is a value that is actually only chosen after this time. So in this time here, it is actually not, has never been chosen yet. Can we use this? Well, it's not totally trivial, but what we can do now, using the structure of space-time here, we can put in a light barrier. So at this, starting from this point, we just put a big black wall in space so that no information can pass through this wall after this dotted line. Um, yeah? Um, well, I could still, p I could put the barrier here, but we will need, I mean, for the putting of the barrier, the Oracle program is not important, but for the next step, it will be important. Um, so what we can put a, a, a big black wall here, starting from this point in time. And since light cannot travel faster than this, putting the barrier here will not influence the data that we get here. So the probability that the adversary wins has not been changed by this programming, at least not only by a small amount, it, and it's not changed by putting the light barrier in, uh, in the universe here. So we have this hypothetical execution, which still has the same attack probability for the adversary. And now we have the following situation. We have split space into two regions, this region and this region, which start, so this, here's some computation. We don't care what happens there, something happens there. Here something happens. This starts with a state that corresponds to the state of the universe on this half and this on this half. They can, of course, be entangled, but they start on two individual uh, quantum registers and do not communicate anymore. And then we have this B, and this B is chosen after the universe has been split into these two states. And now we can use a result from prior work um, it's called a monogamy of entanglement game. If you have a state which is split in, in two, so Alice and Bob have different states, they may be arbitrarily entangled, uh, but only then they are told in which basis they had sh should have to guess what the state psi they had in the beginning was. They cannot do that. So now we have reduced uh, the original setting to this monogamy of entanglement game because we have made two different uh, regions in space. They are entangled, but they get the value B only after they got separated. And that's something that was covered by uh, Tom and Michael et al. That was actually needed for the proof of the pro protocol I showed you before. <clears throat> so this shows that in this modified situation, the success probability is small and therefore in the original setting the success probability is small and therefore the protocol is secure. Okay, so this was the one-dimensional case. And now you might think, oh, let's do the same proof in the many, uh, three, in the three dimensional, one, two, many dimensional case. So in the three-dimensional case, we want to do the same, um, but there's a very subtle thing. So if we take the analog, here we have like this light barrier, which can split space into the area that can reach this dot in time, and the area that can reach this dot in time. In the 3D case, we have four dots, and we can like identify which area of space reaches which verifier in time, and they are not separate. We cannot put a light barrier because they don't fall apart. So um, what we need to do in order to get the th um, proof through, is to program the random oracle not everywhere in space-time at the same time, but at different, in different locations at different times. Because then, this is for the 2D case, here in space-time, this is like the curve where you would program the random oracle at the latest possible moment, uh, and then you get like three areas, what reaches this verifier is this area, what reaches this one is this, what reaches this one is this area, then they fall apart. Yeah. But now if you want to do random oracle programming 
along a curved Cauchy surface in space, you start to be worried. <laughs> and um, fortunately, well, after, well, my first approaches were drawing things like that and wondering whether I can generalize this anyway. But fortunately, I found a nice tool um, to handle uh, cases like this. And I think that this may also be useful for other um, uh, relativistic protocols for analyzing them. Uh, because here, at least, it simplified things a lot. I didn't, didn't need to think about these wild geometries anymore. And I, I even got a security proof in general, general curved space-time, only assuming that there are no closed time-like curves. So what is this tool? It's a very simple technique, but it makes things simpler. It, I introduced the concept of a space-time circuit. So that's a circuit where every gate of the adversary is just at one location in space-time. So you have a quantum circuit, you associate with it each um, gate a location in space-time, and you're only allowed to have wires between the um, gates if it's in the causal direction, so if light can travel from here to here. And, um, sorry? Say again? This one? Yeah, that's just my drawing skill. So they all, so every line, this is not faster than light. Or well, this also not. Uh, yeah. and, and this line is not yet explained. Yeah, this is a light cone. Um, so I just draw the, define this circuit, and the adversary will always be such a circuit. Um, because any computation that obeys relativity can be formulated at such a circuit. And now I just have simple combinator or simple connection. Uh, well, I have the property that for any light cone, for any future light cones, wires can only enter the light cone. And for past light cones, they can only exit the light cone. So using this, I can just write down which areas of the space-time circuit connect, can have wires to which others by looking at the light cone. So I define something like the intersection of the past light cone of this verifier and this verifier. And then I just have some sub-circuits, get some interconnectivity, and then I forget about the geometry totally, and the proof goes through very easily. So this is a tool I recommend also for others who want to use relativistic protocols, because it's, at least in my case, it was much easier. Um, so open problems. Improving the error tolerance. It has only 3.7% uh, error tolerance, which is difficult for implementations. Um, improve the precision in the 3D case. So you could have like less sensitivity to timing delays. I can't explain you why, but there's some reasons. Uh, and most interestingly, from my point of view, is security in the standard model, so without using the random oracle, or perhaps even without hardness assumptions. So if you just assume the entanglement is polynomial. Perhaps you can get the security in that case too, but I have no clue. And uh, yeah, that concludes my talk. Thank you. I have a question about your programming surface. Is your programming surface uh, space-like? I mean, that is, you never yes. have an angle. Okay. So it's morally equivalent to constant time. It is, but arguing about that in a computational setting is es essentially that's what the space space-time circuits do. They allow you to make this fact rigorous that I can kind of flatten it down, but you avoid actually using general relativity theory to argue that because you don't want to do that. Uh, yes, uh, is this um, from what I understand this space-time circuit is. Uh, what is also uh, known as causal sets. So in quantum gravity, there is one discrete approach. Quantum, quantum what? Causal sets. Yeah. So in quantum gravity, there is one approach that uh, takes a starting point, exactly a discrete partial order set, uh, which resembles this. So that's. Uh, yeah, it would be a causal set with gates on it. Yeah, so in yeah. the space time point, there will be gates. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the locations of the circuits are causal sets, and the connection, you are only allowed to have connections along causal lines. Thanks. Do you believe uh, your uh, protocol is still secure if you instantiate a random oracle with a SHA-3? Or do you know of an attack in that case? Uh, I believe so. I mean, I don't have a proof. That's why I use the random oracle. Um, but I see no reason why 
the random oracle heuristic should not work with quantum stuff also. It works classically very well, and I can just con conjecture that it works quantumly. Uh, fixed uh, space-time point always, so couldn't, couldn't a, a possible adversary attempt a strategy that applies a gate in different space-time points? So that would correspond to a superposition of uh, space-time yeah, so circuits. The, the adversary could move around, for example, depending on some data yeah. he gets. Uh, yes, but you could always emulate that by having like a rather dense grid of gates. I mean, this is a huge waste of gates, but it still would be polynomial. So if, if you want to simulate the circuit which is moving around, uh, you just make wherever he might be, you make one gate, and then you have some additional control gates which, given the information where he is now, uses the gate that should be used. 